Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video and an enriching top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic, 10 Secrets to Studying Bible Geography. I sometimes look at the moon on a clear night a quarter million miles away and think, so men have really walked there. But what's even more amazing is a little piece of real estate in the Middle East where God walked and worked and gave himself for me. And this is something that we really should be curious about. And so looking at Bible geography and what the scriptures actually tell us about it. So here we go with our top 10 list, starting with number one. We should recognize that Bible geography is a source of rich blessing. Now Barry Beetzel in his uh, Moody Bible Atlas explains that the word trivia is a geographical term, trivia, where three roads would come together, people would stand and talk and you know, how's the dog and how, how's the crops and so on. And so people think in terms of geography as trivia, but it's not trivia. Uh, Bible geography is in many cases woven right into the story and is an essential part of the storyline. So for example, uh, Abraham, he passes 30 mountains from Beersheba up to Jerusalem. And God says, I will show you the mountain. That's the one right there. And why? Well. Up to that point, it had virtually no historical significance, but that was going to be Calvary. That was going to be the place where the Father and the Son would go together to the cross of Calvary. So I think it's important for us to realize that these geographical terms, if we spend a few minutes checking up what else happened there, for example, we start to realize this is, this is wonderful. This is another dimension to my understanding of the Bible. Number two, because the land is so small, Bible stories pile on top of other stories. Exactly right. You know, from Dan to Beersheba, it's only 150 miles. Joppa to Jericho is about 60 miles. So in that little piece of real estate, about the size of New Jersey, all these Bible stories occur. So Jonah goes down to Joppa to avoid taking the gospel to the Gentiles. And Peter does the same thing. Peter's at Joppa objecting to the idea of taking the gospel to Cornelius. We find uh, the lower fords of Jordan. This is the place where the children of Israel crossed and the river opened up and they walked through on dry ground. Well, then the Lord Jesus comes to the same place but the water doesn't open up for him. He goes under the water. This is a picture of him going under the ways of God's wrath. Yardan, Jordan means coming down from the judge. And he goes under the water, but the heavens open up. And God says, this is my beloved son. I'm well pleased with him. So I think it's important for us to understand this. David, um, he goes across the Kidron, goes up over the Mount of Olives weeping. And so Jesus crosses the Kidron and goes up onto the Mount of Olives weeping. But David comes back, and from all of it, he rides in triumph back into the city after the rebellion of Absalom. And so our Lord Jesus is going to come back to all of it, and he's going to ride in triumph into Jerusalem. So many of these stories in the Old Testament were kind of like dress rehearsals for the big events that are still to come. Number three. Note that the land is small, but strategic. Exactly. Jerusalem is the geographical center of the world. It's the land bridge, the Levant is the land bridge that links together Asia and Europe and Africa. And I think it's important for us to understand that God strategically selected this spot because the Jews were not travelers, but they were traders. And so the world would come through their little piece of real estate 
and God's intention was that they would taste the sweet fruit of Israel being rooted in God and be attracted to him. And so this little bit of land, the scripture says, um, thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her, Ezekiel 5 verse 5. So this land bridge became the place where the superpowers of the ancient world, and whether it was Egypt or Nubia or Ethiopia, whether it was Babylon, Assyria, Medo-Persia, whatever it was, this was the territory that they traveled through and engaged with God when they engaged with the nation of Israel. It's not only the geographical center, it's the salvation center. This is the spot where the ground turned red with the blood of the Son of God, where the sun refused to shine, where the devil was crushed into the dust and death forever lost its sting. So obviously we, we have an attraction, not simply to a shrine, but to the place where theology and history and geography all meet. Obviously we should be interested in that little land. And then thirdly, it's the eternal glory center of the world. Uh, this is the place from which the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And to this little place, again, the save will return and he'll establish his kingdom from the city of Jerusalem. So yes, it it's, uh, should be the focus of our attention. When we think about the Bible, we should recognize that God exercised his plan in time and space with real people and real places and it ought to stir our curiosity. Number four, note the land today is a modern miracle. It is indeed. It's an ethnic miracle. You can walk the streets of Jerusalem and hear just about any language in the world. People from all over, the wandering Jew as they're called, have returned from every land in this alia, this coming back. And it's just astounding to see. In the Jerusalem Post, almost every month, they'll have a little note saying all the Jews from this country or that country have returned to the land of Israel. So it's an ethnic miracle. And then secondly, it's a linguistic miracle, a dead language that was only spoken by a few religious leaders is now the common language on the street. They say that if Jeremiah returned today, he could read the morning paper. The sounds may not be the same, but the spelling is. And when the language was rebuilt, they went back to its original. They didn't simply Hebrewize words the way we have done with words from other languages. They actually reconstructed the words with Hebrew basis. The amazing thing is that the Hebrew language today is the language of the children in the streets. And because of this bringing back of people from other countries, the children very often are the first ones to learn Hebrew. And so they end up teaching their parents the native tongue. <laughs> but then thirdly, it's a miracle of military might. The Jews were not fighters and they had to return and they had to learn fast because the whole world around them was seeking to destroy them. Zechariah 12 2 says, Jerusalem is a cup of trembling to all people around her. And the amazing thing is that this little country is in the paper almost every day. And we see this in the United Nations. There's a special category of censure that is, that is on the books every time they meet. They censure the little land of Israel. And so all the world is gathered against. And why is that? Well, it's demonic. It's the devil at work seeking to destroy the Jewish people to make God a liar. Fourthly, it's an agricultural miracle. Israel, the Jews were given a swampy coast. They were given a barren land. The trees had been cut off, destroyed. The desert, the Negev in the south, that's what they were given. And they've turned it into the bread basket of the Middle East. They feed all their enemies. The food is taken down, crosses the Allenby Bridge. It's unmarked. The Jordanians have an arrangement where they put their stickers on it, and then it's sold to 
the Jews' enemies to the Iraqis and the Iranians and so on, and they essentially feed the Middle East. They are the ones who've developed a plastic mulch and drip irrigation, and they don't let a drop of water go until they've used it three or four times. And it's astounding to see the harvest. They export tulips to Holland. Uh, and of course, we enjoy their Jaffa oranges, but there are lots of other products that are spread around the world from that little country. So when they took it over, it was nothing but a, a wasteland. And so today we look at the nation of Israel. They still have to be reborn spiritually, but geographically, militarily, linguistically, and ethnically, they've been reborn. And there's one last great rebirth that's going to happen when the Lord Jesus returns. Number five, the land is divided into four political strips and four topographical strips. It's a bit like North America, where our political barrier boundary runs east and west, but all the land forms, the western Cordillera and the Great Plains and the, the eastern Appalachian Range and so on, they all run north and south. And it's largely the same in Israel. So we have Galilee in the north, and then Samaria, and then Judea, and then Edom or Idumea in the south. But the landforms form these narrow strips running north and south. So you have the coastal plain, you have the central highlands, you have the north end of the great African Rift Valley, the Jordan Valley, and then you have the eastern plateau. And so if you can get that in your mind when you're looking at the land, it doesn't take too long until you start to find your way around. Number six, the sudden changes in altitude give surprising variety to the country. Yeah, this is something that's quite shocking. If you think Israel is all just desert or all just green grass, you start to travel there in a matter of a few minutes, you're changing scenes dramatically. So from the heights of Mount Hermon, 9,000 feet, the only snow-capped peak in the land of Israel, down to the bottom of the Dead Sea is 2,400 feet below sea level. I mean, Death Valley, California is 282 feet below sea level. So this is the lowest spot on the surface of the earth. And it happens in a relatively short distance, 120 miles. So that means you can be snow skiing in the morning, water skiing in the afternoon on the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is already 680 feet below sea level. And so around the shoreline, this is subtropical. This is like South Florida, like Miami, along the shoreline. And they're growing avocados and bananas along the shoreline. But halfway up the hillside, now you're in the temperate zone. Now it's like Michigan. So they can grow bananas and apples on the same hillside. If you don't like the climate, just go uphill or downhill a little bit, and you've changed a whole climatic zone. So you can be standing in Jerusalem in the winter, and it's snowing in Jerusalem, and 20 miles away, it's 110 degrees in the shade down at the Dead Sea. And so because of this dramatic change, they can grow just about anything you can grow anywhere in the world. It's the greatest flyway of all the European birds. They say over a billion birds travel through the land of Israel every year going north and south. And whether it's swampland or mountainous or fields of grain or whatever it is, whatever environment these birds need, it's all available there. It's astounding. So when the supper of the great God occurs, there'll be no shortage of birds. And then uh, number seven, the Lord Jesus is linked with every area of the land. When we read the Bible, sometimes we don't read it 3D. You know, it's everything's flat. We need to get out our atlas and look and see some of these details. So the Lord Jesus was, of course, at Bethlehem in his birth, Nazareth in his hidden years, Jordan at his baptism, the Judean wilderness during his temptation, Cana, his early miracles, and then Galilee, where he was rejected and he traveled 
to Jerusalem, to all of it, and his crucifixion and resurrection, and then back up to the Galilee and so on. And of course, he's coming back. The history is going to continue there. The cry is going to be, open up those doors and let the king of glory in. This is not a fairy tale. It's really going to happen. So when we think about the land, it's good for us to think in 3D. For example, when Jesus was in Nazareth, right? At 30 years of age, they took him and they were going to throw him over the hill into the valley and stone him to death. We rarely ask the question, what valley was that? But we discover it's the valley of Armageddon. Jesus grew up every day. Nazareth sits on the last of the Galilee mountains, pushing like the prow of a ship into the valley of Armageddon. So when he got up every morning and looked out across the valley, he was looking at the very scene where his final victory will be won. It really is breathtaking when we begin to think in those terms and see the Bible not as flat, but as having all these details. Then number eight, a few good tools and some patience will reap a rich harvest. I think it's good for us to have a good atlas and maybe even make some notes when we see some of these connections. But a good atlas, a Bible handbook, because there are lots of places in the Bible that have Old Testament names and different New Testament names, because one's Hebrew and one has the influence of the Greek or or the Latin or whatever. And so we start to realize that the Sea of Tiberias the Sea of Galilee, and Kinneret. These are all the same place. And so we don't want to be confused into thinking these are different places. And so a Bible handbook is great for that. And having your own notebook, especially one small enough, so if you ever get the chance to visit Israel, you can slip it in your camera bag and take it with you. And then, of course, I think it's important for us to become familiar with the geography in the Bible itself and take notice of that as we're reading through and we notice a geographical term, keep it clearly in our minds. Number nine, read a little, record a little, review a little. This is the path to success. Right. It's uh, it's a huge subject and you can give your whole life to it. One of the warnings I would raise is relative to Bible archaeology. Sometimes on the one hand, there are people who fabricate things, um, sensationalize things. There was a famous fellow over in the Middle East who did this sort of thing, who said that he found the spot under the cross. There's a cave, Jeremiah's Grotto, and he said that the Ark of the Covenant had been hidden away there and Jesus' blood had dropped, and there was a little crack in the rock, and the blood had dripped all the way down the crack and landed on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant that had been hidden in the days of Jeremiah. You see, uh, this sort of thing really is very unfortunate, and we don't need that sort of thing. On the other hand, most of the archaeologists in Israel are minimalists. They don't believe in Abraham. They don't even believe in David and some of the other characters. They think they were like actually historical figures, but they've been fictionalized like Davy Crockett or something like that. And so it's hard to find good archaeological information. There are some. When we look carefully at some of the archaeology, archaeological findings, they are very encouraging because they do line up with what the scripture says. But there are a lot of people who have a vested interest in the Bible not being true. And so that's an area we need to be concerned about. But when you're going through the Bible, my suggestion is to read the narrative sections of the Bible that involve the land of Israel. So you're not going to read until Genesis 12, when Abraham comes into the land. And then, of course, when the children of Israel, the focus goes back to Egypt, then you stop reading and you go over to Joshua and Judges and Ruth and then you're into Samuel and you read these sections and as you do, make a little note. So Abram comes to Shechem. So you make a listing for Shechem and you find the meaning of the word shoulder 
and you describe it, it's in the saddle between these two mountains, Ebal and Gerizim, so many miles north of Jerusalem, and so on. And then you put down, number one, Abraham's first altar. And then you read on. And then he moves to Bethel, and so you make a second listing for Bethel. And you notice that there's an alternate name for Bethel. Later on, it's called Beth Avin, which means a house of sin instead of the house of God. And so then you make these mark, and you keep adding to that. And as you do that, you start to see certain events occurring at the same places. You start to see these connections. And that's what's so exciting when bone comes to bone, like in Ezekiel's Valley, and you start to see these wonderful relationships between events through the Bible. When we see the Pool of Siloam, for example, in Isaiah, it's described as a picture of the Messiah. So when we get to the story of the blind man being sent to the Pool of Siloam, and John pauses to tell us that Siloam means sent, and this is one of the key words in John's Gospel, that Jesus is the sent one, it gets pretty exciting. And you say, well, what is this man actually doing? Going and soaking in the Messiah of the Old Testament. When people can't see Christ in the New Testament, tell them to go soak in the Old Testament for a while. And they'll come seeing, they'll see the Messiah there, right? So there are these wonderful connections that otherwise we might miss if we're not trying to highlight Bible geography. And then lastly, number 10, finally realize it will be far better to spend a moment where Christ is than a lifetime where he was. (laughs) That's exactly right. All we need to understand everything we need to know about the Christian life is the Bible. God has seen to it that we don't actually even need a teacher. I don't need anyone to teach me because I have the Holy Spirit. Now, God has gifted us with teachers and we thank God for the enriching ministry of teachers. But he set it up so that if I was the only Christian in the world, I'd have all the resources I need to live a godly life, to know Christ, to live in the power of the Spirit, and to accomplish his will for my life. So while it's good to know Bible geography and to travel in the land and so on, we sometimes overestimate the value of walking where Jesus walked or getting baptized in the Jordan. There's nothing magical about these things, and we shouldn't treat them as magical. The essential thing is to have a healthy, happy, holy relationship with Christ. And when I do that, then some of these things add to and enrich my life. We shouldn't major in things that the Bible minors in. And what we want to see when we turn to the Word of God is not simply more geography information. We want to see the Lord, to meet with Him, to engage with Him. And uh, we're looking forward to the day when that little place where once the Savior was crucified will be the place where he reigns. And so I used to say, before someone paid for a trip to Israel for me, I used to say, uh, I think I'll just go during the millennium when the prices are down. But I have since seen the great value of studying and visiting the land. And if people can do it, it's a great thing to do. But it's not the most important thing. The most important thing is to draw near to the Lord in our own hearts and minds and to live there rather than traveling halfway around the world hoping for some kind of holy experience there. We can have it on our knees in the presence of the Lord wherever we are.